You're listening to Covering the Fields with your host, Joe Ellison. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to Covering the Field, the weekly program that analyzes all sports, handicaps them, and makes and reviews predictions. I'm your host, Joe Ellison, and today we're going to talk about pro football, college football, Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, NASCAR, and our You Got Ho segment. We'd like to remind you listeners to email us at coveringthefield at gmail.com. Please give us your feedback, tell us your You Got Ho stories, and visit our coveringthefield.com website. Find us on Twitter at Covering Field. Now, kicking things off this week, I'd like to introduce our football expert, Big Richard Martin. How are you doing today? Doing great, Joe. Great to be on the show. Week five is finished in the National Football League. What caught your attention last weekend? Week five is finished, and so are the Detroit Lions, 0-5. Can you believe they lost again in another last-minute play? And unfortunately, Detroit Lions are pretty much done for the season, don't you think? Uh, Yeah, I think so. I, I don't see them going on any kind of big win streak. They're better off losing at this point and getting a better draft pick and maybe drafting a quarterback. What do you think about that? I think uh, Jared Goff uh, is definitely needs to be replaced out there in Detroit. What else caught my eye was Dallas Cowboys, man. How about that? Four in a row now? 44 to 20 over the G-men. Yeah, the Bills just roll over Kansas City on Sunday night in a big rainstorm. Made Patrick Holmes look silly out there. Bills are definitely a team in the AFC. And the other team in the NFC, the Arizona Cardinals, they beat the San Francisco 49ers 17-10. to 10. Yeah, that was good. Uh, I was on that one. You didn't mention anything about our uh, friend John Gruden and his emails. Uh, emails he had been um, giving to Bruce Allen, who is a former, former executive with the Washington Redskins. Back in 2011, uh, apparently they've been doing an investigation on the old Washington Redskins and found these emails. What are your thoughts on that? John, I got got Gruden. Just lost $700 million for uh, inappropriate emails, inappropriate things that can't be said as an executive in the NFL. Just embarrassing. He did the right thing stepping down. Uh, you could tell that affected the game plan this week with the Raiders. They looked horrible. Of course, he had this on his mind. And we'll talk about that when you got the hose section. Yeah, that's going to be hard to defend John Gruden now. Um, maybe a couple things, yeah, maybe you can understand, but uh, uh, the things he said about uh, women and, uh, you know, uh, DeMarie Smith, and you got the, the commissioner. I mean, it was a long list of people that he was going after. So, yeah, it seems like yeah, uh, everybody was a target with him. So there went uh, there went $70 million down, uh, down the tubes and probably any kind of, a television career or, or anything, pretty much. He's pretty much finished with football, you'd have to think. Yeah, I don't think we'll be seeing him on the NFL ticket anytime soon. So how about uh, the field goal kicking last week? How about that? 12 missed field goals and 12 missed extra points. That's never been done before. In that Green Bay game, uh, Mason Crosby had kicked the winning kick like four times. Well, the only last one counts, and that's the one he got. So, I mean, I got him a win, so I still think, uh, you know, he comes through. He's a veteran kicker. He'll come back from that. But, yeah, definitely uh, – it's not a round ball, and it doesn't go straight all the time. I think we're going to have to go to, uh, like, Europe or uh, Australia or New Zealand and try to find some decent field goal kickers, uh, guys who are done with their rugby careers, to come to America. And uh, if they don't mind putting on pads and a helmet, which they never do in rugby, but uh, they kick from some outrageous angles. We're kicking from directly in front of the post. And we can't seem to make him. Uh, what about the guy from Seattle? He punted the ball twice. He punted, you know, I mean, he got two punts on one kick. How did that happen? I don't know. But Mike Pereira, uh, Mr. Uh, know-it-all uh, referee, said you can't kick it twice. But apparently the punter knew more than the head of refereeing at one time, uh, Mike Pereira. Uh, as long as the ball does not go past the line of scrimmage, you're allowed to punt it again. But it only was like a 75-yard punt. punt or something. It was amazing. Yes, it was, and uh, we all learned something from that. That was a that was a great heads up play. Baltimore streak of 100 yards rushing in a game. Uh, the big controversy last week. Well, that ended the very next week. Uh, at least they tied the 74-77 Steelers 100 yards rushing in each game, or whatever it was, 23 games in a row, something like that. Uh, impressive streak, but maybe the uh, 
the Bronco coach now can uh, be happy that that's over with. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing to cry about in Denver except for their last week's game against Pittsburgh, that's for sure. Oh, yes. They didn't play well. And, um, yes, Detroit did lose. I didn't see how they lost, but the, the coach was crying afterwards. It's terrible. Uh, I don't see how Detroit's going to win a game for a while, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, they got Cincinnati so the next pick? week, so that's not an easy yeah. task the way the, the Bengals are playing right now. But they seem to be fighting for their coach. They're playing the whole game, so I think they are going to get a win eventually. Okay, not this so, week, but we'll see. Yeah. So the picks last week, how did you do on your choices in the pro? Well, I did do good. Uh, one and three, so that's absolutely horrible. Um, I did have the Raiders, and they, they lost. And so it, was, it wasn't a good week, but we're ready to bounce back this week in the NFL. NFL is tough to call sometimes, and definitely last week was one of them. Indeed. Well, my picks were three for three. I'm humble brag here. Uh, I had the Chargers. Uh, I must say I was very lucky, and that is the uh, reverse you got ho story I'm going to have later. It's a, a tease. And I had Buffalo and over. Buffalo plus three, one by 18. Um, got the uh, over, no, 58. So, yeah, three for three. I'm loving it. Good job, Joe. And Great any, job. Any new injuries for week that we should be uh, concerned about. Well, the big injury, of course, was Russell Wilson on Thursday uh, when he was looking at his coach and he was pointing to which way he was pointing. It wasn't going the wrong direction. His middle finger was definitely broken. Um, he definitely couldn't play again. Geno Smith came in, played a great uh, backup role, almost got the win, made it close at the end. Um, but he's out for, I think they said, six to eight weeks. Um, he had surgery on his hand, I think, last Thursday, so he's out for a while. Uh, Barkley went out with an ankle injury. Um, so that was a big injury. Uh, they showed a close-up on his ankle, and it looked like he just was playing schoolyard basketball when you roll your ankle, and that thing ballooned right up. And uh, quarterback Derek Jones goes out with a uh, concussion during that game also. So the Giants are definitely banged up. No doubt. Uh, Barkley uh, and Jones being hurt. Um, Jones has a chance to play. It doesn't look like Barkley does. Uh, Wilson, uh, I think the story was a little better uh, than you heard. I, I heard that he has a possibility of coming back in, in five weeks, that he would be out four, and he's generally a quick healer. He's never missed a game in his entire career until now. So uh, I'm expecting him to come back a little quicker. Um, Smith-Schuster, done for the season for Pittsburgh, and Clyde Edwards-Alaire out for three weeks for Kansas City, those seem like the main injuries uh, to worry about. Of course, there's numerous others. It's the NFL. Absolutely. Week five, we haven't had any bye weeks. So I think we start the bye next week. Is that correct? Uh, this week or, or the bye? Yeah. First week. First week of the byes are this week coming up. Keep that in mind, everybody. Your favorite team might not be playing. Might be a good weekend to uh, go have some fun, go somewhere where it's nice and warm because it's certainly not warm out here in Carson City these days. Yeah, definitely um, check your uh, – if you're playing fantasy football, make sure you have your players in. Uh, if they're on bye week, make sure to get a, get on that waiver wire and pick somebody up for your starters that might be out on a bye week. Another thing to note also, Christian McCaffrey's practicing this week. He was limited last week, so he's practicing this week. So he's he's looking like uh, good to go. And uh, Delvin Cook from Minnesota also was out last week. He's looking to come back this week. And we should also note uh, there is another game in London for our fantasy football players, listeners. Uh, Miami and Jacksonville, 6.30 in the morning, our time here. Get your lineup ready. That's in right. you have any money. <laughs> exactly. Early yeah, football, early football. Mm -hmm. So what are your predictions for this week in the pros? Well, let's just start with Cincinnati. They're at Detroit. They're dropping three and a half. I think that uh, Detroit finds another way to lose. I think Cincinnati had multiple chances to win you know, at Green Bay last week. And I think that uh, Cincinnati does get it done this week, three and a half. I like the Rams, uh, especially the first half at the Giants. Um, if Derek Jones does play, um, he's not practicing, so he's not with his first team offense during practice this week. We'll know more on Wednesday. You know what his injury is. I mean, on Friday, when we come back with the final injury report, he did not practice today at all. So even though he has a concussion, he was not even in no contact drills. And uh, so they're dropping nine and a half. We'll probably be about four and a half, five first half. I like the Rams to cover. I like the Rams first half. I also like uh, the Broncos first half against the Las Vegas uh, Raiders. 
four out of five weeks, they were at double digit deficits in the first half. Um, with this big uh, Gruden thing going on right now, I don't see that changing. So I like uh, the Broncos first half. Watch that three and a half. I don't like the three and a half. That's uh, Raiders and Broncos are always a field goal game. And then also Pittsburgh is dropping five against Seattle. Seattle's defense look horrible. So let's just go and uh, go with that there. I like Pittsburgh dropping five. Big Ben looked good last week against the Broncos. I think they get it done on the uh, Sunday game against Seattle. All right. Well, you're not picking any of my games. Uh, I, I like, um, first of all, the over in Kansas City and Washington, the over 55 and a half. Uh, it seems like both teams can score. Neither team has any defense. I don't know what happened to Washington's defense last year. Uh, something happened in the off season. It just uh, disappeared. And uh, Kansas City, they've had five games. Four of them have gone over. Both of their road games have gone over. Washington has also gone, gone four out of five. of Their games have gone over. In fact, four straight have gone over. And two out of three of their home games. So the numbers are definitely pointing towards a very high-scoring game. I got to go back to the Chargers again, plus three at Baltimore. Chargers just look really good, looking more and more like a Super Bowl contender every week. Four out of five games against the spread they've covered, both their road games. Baltimore, uh, only two out of five of their games they've covered, one out of two at home and the short week, having played on Monday night. And I got to keep betting against Jacksonville. I can't help it. Miami minus three and a half at Jacksonville. Miami actually plays better on the road. Tua should be coming back is what I hear, and that should be an improvement uh, improvement over Brissett. Jacksonville uh, has not covered any of their three home games, one and four against the spread. We're going to go with uh, Miami there. Oh, the, on Kansas that City. L.A. Charger game there, Joe, that's a good point. Um, the money line on that game is uh, one plus 150. So if you think that the Chargers get it done um, and they're playing on the road against Cleveland, that's correct? Uh, Baltimore. Baltimore. So that's pl they're plus 150 in that game. So I like that for sure. So that'll do it for uh, pros. Let's move on to college. So what were the big happenings in NC2A football last week? Well, you know, the big happening, it was your pick last week that you were talking about the Alabama Crimson Tide upset, upset, upset. Alabama had a, a seven point lead in the fourth quarter and gives up a touchdown with three minutes left. And then they can't convert. And then uh, Zach Casada takes him down the field and gets a win of field goal at Texas A&M College Station. What an upset. What a game. Congratulations, Jimbo Fisher's 56th birthday. And he got a big birthday present there, that's for sure. Against his ex-coach. Exactly. We talked last week. I mean, Nick Saban was like 33-0 and against his ex-coaches. Well, that's like the Baltimore record. It's over now. Without a doubt. Uh, Georgia. Now the new number one as Alabama was number one. We had that one right. We did. Yeah, no, we last had year of the college last week of the college. I was eight and five, so I was definitely respectable and um, made up from my Sunday woes for sure. Um, but yeah, Georgia looked great. They covered. They smashed Auburn. That was not even a contest. That defense has eleven players that are probably playing uh, in the NFL next year. Yeah, they they certainly deserve to be number one, and uh, it's going to be. Tough for them to uh, be beaten. Alabama might get another crack at them down the road. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. It is the Southeastern Conference. Right. Somebody could sneak. Uh, well, know, Alabama still controls run. their destiny because Georgia's in the is in the East. Alabama's in the West, so they can get them in the final game there. Bryce Young played great. He had three touchdowns, 369 yards, and two of them to wide receiver Jameson Williams. And Brian uh, Robinson, their lead running back, had 147 yards. So the offense played good. We knew that the linebackers are banged up in that game, and Texas A&M had a surprise because they were playing really lousy all year, and then they came up with a great game at College Station. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm tired of Alabama, so I hope Georgia runs into Alabama again and beats, uh, and beats Alabama, and that will give Alabama two losses and they will not even be part of the playoff. Right. That's and they're, you know, you look at Georgia, they don't even have JT Daniels played the last two weeks. Uh, they don't even have their starting quarterback, and they're still looking great. Defense, defense, defense. It is pretty amazing to watch. Absolutely. And Iowa beating Penn State, um, 
you know, that was kind of a flukish kind of win. Um, you watched that game, didn't you? Absolutely. That was the game of the week. Three and four were playing. Uh, Sean Clifford had that team running their starting quarterback. They were up 17 to three. He had a, he was 15 for, uh, for 25, 146 yards at a touchdown. Um, he was playing great. And uh, he goes down with a shoulder injury. Uh, they bring in T. Robinson, and his numbers were, since he came in for the starting quarterback, 7 for 20 and 34 yards passing with two interceptions. So he, they have no backup defense. They, they had no backup plan. And I think if Clifford would have played, they would have rolled. Iowa came back. They were down. They outscored him in the fourth quarter, 17-3 uh, to three and won 23-3. to. I mean, 13 to three, they won 23 to 20, taking me on my pick. I look, I thought for sure that was a winner at halftime. And, you know, Spencer Porters, he's not flashy, but he gets it done. He was 17 for 31 with two touchdowns. Penn State lost, but they do control their own destiny because they're in the West and the Big Ten. So they play, still have games against Michigan, 5-0, and Michigan State and Ohio State in front of them. I was just rolling um, in the East out there, or the West out there. Um, the Big Ten West, they have their two games in front of everybody. I think Minnesota has one win in their conference. That's the closest one. Right. Uh, how about that Big Ten, huh? Five Big Ten teams in the top ten for the first time ever. Obviously, that's not going to last because they're going to start playing each other. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you said well, Michigan beat Nebraska 39-21. They're 3-0 and in the conference yep. and 6-0 and overall. Michigan State beat Rutgers handily 31-17. to They're 3-0 and in the conference, and they're 6-0 and overall. And Ohio State smashed Maryland. They sixty six to seventeen. They're three and zero and five and one overall. So that West is wide open. That could go to any one of those teams. You got Penn State coming in, so they're going to play each other. It's going to be great. Uh, Ohio State has been rolling. C.J. Stroud is thrown for seventeen hundred yards and eighteen touchdowns this year, and he threw for four hundred uh, yards this week against Maryland. So, I mean, Ohio State's rolling. ronde has got them playing good. So that Big Ten is going to be interesting. Without a doubt. And how about the Big 12? We had a pretty interesting game, Oklahoma. Well, of course we did. We had the Red River rivalry, Texas and Oklahoma. What a game that was, huh? That might have been one of the best games I've ever seen. I was flipping these games back and forth with Arkansas on this game. It was such a good game. Uh, Casey Thompson had five touchdowns, 388 yards quarterback for Texas. Bijan Robinson had a 50-yard run. He looked great. He had two TDs at 137 yards rushing, or one TD at 37. And Oklahoma State, they pulled your boy, your pick for the Heisman Trophy, uh, Spencer, I got rattled the rattler, and he gets replaced by Caleb Williams, who came in and just changed the tide in that game. Unbelievable comeback, back and forth. It was 48-48 with 13 seconds left. It looked like Oklahoma was going to just run a sweep to the left and just so they can kick the field goal and oh um kennedy brooks comes up with a 60 or 50 yard run in for a touchdown for a walk-off touchdown run he had 217 yards on the day with two touchdowns he looked great oklahoma's defense is definitely spect uh, spectable but we have to know that was a great comeback and a great momentum win for oklahoma who now is what three or four in the they're four in the nation now joe well it depends on which uh poll you're looking at three or four the official one that decides who's in the uh, playoff hasn't started yet. That's the committee who decides on that one, but uh, three or four, yeah, depending on who you look at. Right. But so yeah, Oklahoma has a great comeback. Far, what a game that was. Uh, I'm already going to make my prediction for the Heisman Trophy next year. Uh, Caleb Williams, <laughs> uh, quarterback of Oklahoma. Uh, Spencer Rattler is not going to win the Heisman this year. Uh, not not having been benched, that's for sure. Yeah, I know. Uh, that, that, that was the final nail in the coffin for sure. It was Heisman thing. He's done. And, uh, yeah, Caleb Williams is going to start next week for sure. And the other game I want to talk about, Joe, is the bounce back bowl. Yeah. Uh, Arkansas and Ole Miss. Arkansas coming off a, a loss to Georgia. Ole Miss coming off a loss to Alabama. And that was a great game kj jefferson for arkansas he had 326 yards pass and 94 yards rushing he looked great or 85 yards rushing and then matt carroll for old miss he was had 287 yards two touchdowns passing 94 yards rushing with another two touchdowns it looked like these two were going to definitely be sunday quarterbacks next year uh we talked about kj jefferson last year being referenced to cam newton and matt carroll moved it to the front runner of the Heisman Trophy, in my opinion. And I think that he looks good. And I think a lot of NFL teams want to put him on his squad next year. And we can't forget Nevada 
they did win 55-28. They had the spread covered. They were down 7-zip, scored 52 unanswered. Uh, they are up 52-7 to seven and ended up winning only by 27. The spread was 30. New Mexico State scored on a one-yard touchdown run with six seconds left. Could have been part of the You Got Hose segment. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they had the underclassmen playing in that last fourth quarter, getting a little playing time at home. Yep, for sure. And Boise knocked BYU out of the unbeaten ranks in BYU, right. which means no playoff, probably no New York New Year's Day Bowl. Probably everything went out the window with that loss. Absolutely. I mean, they had three three fumbles and, and two of them inside the red zone. Uh, they you cough the ball up like that against a, a rival like Boise State. You're you're even though you're at home, you're still gonna have a tough time winning. And they just seemed like they just couldn't get it together. You know, um, they're at home. They should have definitely. That's a game they have to win if they want to be in contention for the national championship. You could just say BYU is definitely out of that for sure now. And your picks, you said, went to eight and five last week, I believe. Eight and said. five on the college rank, so that was good. And yeah. I had the Texas game called all the way to the last minute. It looked like they were, I mean, they were up 28 to seven in the first half. I'm like, this game's over. They're definitely the right there for sure if you had yeah. Texas. Right. And then I also had Penn State last year. It was another got hose section. You know, they lose the quarterback and just seemed like the whole team fell apart. And don't take nothing away from that Iowa defense. They're, they're lights out. But, I mean, they he was definitely keeping that offense on the field and rolling down the down the field with, you know, the 17-3 lead when he went out. So uh, going into next week, uh, any particular injuries or you just want to go into predictions? Let's just go into the predictions here. That's week six and everybody's banged up and for sure. So there's bumps and bruises all over, but let's go and go over our predictions. I didn't see anything major um, of people that are out in the college ranks, except for uh, Spencer Rathard, his pride's out. So he'll definitely not be playing this week, but let's start with the Thursday game. Um, Memphis has given up 10 and a half over Navy. Uh, Navy's one of four. Memphis is at home. They're rolling. Their only losses to my University of Texas San Antonio Roadrunners. So, uh, and that was a great game back and forth. I think Memphis has no problem with Navy. Okay, uh, that's one. I know you got a couple more than that. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and look at Cincinnati. I told you Cincinnati last week. I said Cincinnati's got to run the score up to get their respect. So there's. I was number two in the nation. So you got. Cincinnati still riding four after their big whoop down last week of Temple. They're at home against UCF. Dropped twenty one. Watch his kids, uh, D- uh, Desmond Rattler. He has got uh, fifteen touchdowns running and passing this year. He's thrown for thirteen hundred yards. He's still trying to get the Heisman. I like I like Cincinnati. I'm going to keep riding with those Bobcats until they prove me wrong. And then I also like LSU getting ten over Florida. Uh, LSU it had a big game against uh, you know Mississippi State. And uh, uh, and then also beat Texas A&M. So I'd like them at home against Florida. I think that game will be lower uh, scoring game in the 10.5 at home. I love Michigan State minus four at Indiana. We talked about your quarterback. Uh, Penix is out for the year. So I think that Michigan State and that running game is just killing it. Um, the running back uh, walker for him, he's like he's got like almost a thousand yards already this year. Arkansas on a bounce back game against Auburn, they're giving three and a half. Um, so they Arkansas will get it done at home this week. Mississippi State is plus 17. I saw it move down to plus 16 and a half. If you get Mississippi State at home with 17 points, Alabama's defense is definitely respectable. I like uh, Mississippi State to get it done. Uh, Mississippi State beat Texas A&M. So Texas A&M beat Arkansas. It looks like 17 points is a good bet, even though Alabama will bounce back. Um, And Ole Miss has given up three at Tennessee. So I'm going to take Matt Carroll in this Heisman Trophy run to cover that spread at Tennessee. Nice. Uh, I think you're in trouble on on three picks. Syracuse plus 13 and a half against uh, Clemson. I like that one a lot. Uh, Michigan State minus the three and a half. You said went up to four at Indiana. I'm going to pick that one. And Texas San Antonio minus the 18 and a half against Rice. Uh, yeah, Texas San Antonio picks. is six and zero oh and five and one against the spread. So they're a sleeper team. We brought them out here on our first podcast on the first college football one and. Um, you know, they got a great McCormick's a great running back at there. Spencer McCormick's a great running back. They got a great team. They brought back their whole team from last year. which they were like nine and one last year. So I see him continue to roll. Good choice there, Joe. All right. Well, thank you, Richard.
We'll have you on later in the You Got Ho segment. All right. Thanks, Joe. Next up to talk about the playoffs is our Major League Baseball analyst, Ronnie McKinnon. How's it going today, Ronnie? Joe, I'm doing cool. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. When we last chatted Wednesday, we were getting ready to watch the wild card playoff game between St. Louis and the Los Angeles Dodgers. What happened in that game? Yeah, it was a good game uh, all the way till um, right at the end. And uh, the Dodgers hit a two-run home run and, and uh, uh, won it 3-1. to one. Yeah, it was. Uh, it went four hours, and the score was still one to one. That's right. That, that had to be the most scoring four-hour game in the history of baseball, or pretty close to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it especially when there's not a lot of uh, runs scored, and it's more pitching. Usually, that goes fast, and um, uh, that didn't happen. So now the Dodgers faced up against the rival San Francisco Giants. What's been happening in that series? Well, the Dodgers just won um, last night to tie the series up two to two. Um, So they'll be playing game five in San Francisco tomorrow night. And um, the winner will go to the um, NLCS against um, Atlanta. And who's our pitching matchup for tomorrow night? I, I, um, oh, for the, the, the Dodger game, the Dodger giant game. Yeah. It will be Webb for the giants. Who's been just, lights out and um Urias will be pitching for the Dodgers. So Webb is the one who threw the shutout first game. And the game is in San Francisco. Is it possible the Giants might actually be favored? Did you see a line on that? I did not. I would imagine they they probably would be because they're at home and because Webb is pitching and he's just been phenomenal. Um so I would I haven't seen it. I would think the Giants might be favored by a little bit, but I'm not sure. Well, that's going to be definitely the game to watch of the first round, the game plus. Well, it's yeah, and it's the game. it's the only game left and all all the other um three series are already over with. So, um I would imagine uh, everybody will be tuned into that one, especially with that rivalry. We had a bit of a surprise in the Atlanta Milwaukee series. Well, yeah, I actually, um, I think a a lot of people were um, surprised about that and maybe even more so about Boston beating Tampa Bay. Um, Both those series only went four games. Uh, Boston beat Tampa Bay and Atlanta beat Milwaukee. So, and I, you know, I thought Tampa Bay would, would win and, and keep going, but it doesn't surprise me that Boston won. Those guys can hit. And um, I'm actually a, a uh, Boston fan um, in basketball with the Celtics and the and the Red Sox in baseball. So I'll be rooting for Boston, and um, I think they have a, a, a really good shot. Um, Houston will be um, at home. They have the home field uh, because uh, they won their division and Boston was a wild card. But um, it's interesting because um, through the season, Houston scored like 863 runs and Boston had 829. The home runs were like 221 to 219, Houston, Boston, respectively. The ERA, Houston had a little bit better ERA at 376. Boston was 426. And the team average was 261 for Boston and 267 for Houston. So I think it's going to be, um, they both can hit. Um, Houston, eh, people would say maybe they have a little slight advantage with the pitching, but um, yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be a really good series. And um, I'm actually rooting and predicting Boston. Well, I'd like to see Boston win it. My, I got futures at 75 to one on Boston. It'd be really nice. I'm going to have to hedge. Of course, Boston, um, they, they didn't win it without controversy though. There was that game three, the eighth inning. Um, there, there, there was a ball that, bounced off of a player and went over the fence and it was it looked like a, a run was going to score easily but then it didn't count and then it ended up going to the 13th inning and nobody had scored since that controversy right the um i mean that was the right call uh, by the rule book um it actually hit uh, the boston hunter renfro uh, was the right fielder hit his it actually hit the wall hit the ground hit his thigh and then went over the fence um, he did not by and by replay, obviously, you can see he did not do it on purpose. So that's in the rule book that that's a, a ground rule double. And the guy that was on first had to hold up at third. Otherwise, he would have scored. And um, so, yeah, a tough, a tough break, uh, obviously. But um, 
that's that's in the rules. Speaking of rules, Nelson Cruz hit that home run that, that never left the park, but landed on the field, hit the ceiling or something, ended up being a home run. Right. Well, you know, they have a lot, obviously with a dome and a ceiling, you know, there's a lot of different ground rules, which the umpires go over before the game with each manager, um, because each field is different. Uh, you know, Boston's a really weird field at, at Fenway Park. A lot of weird things happen there. So, um, you know, and, and each each field is is different. So okay, and in that same game, Randy Rosarana, boy, I think I said his name wrong. Rosarina? And oh. Yeah, that's him. He hit a home run and stole home in the same game. Yeah. Now, I don't think that has it. No, that was the, the, the first player in the game to do that. Um, and it was uh, also 2021 20, uh, playoff debut. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was game one um, where uh, Tampa Bay actually won five to nothing that game, uh, which was last Thursday on the 7th. Not even Willie Mays had done that before. That's I just find that hard to believe. But uh, yeah, back in the per- day, there was more feeling of home than there is now. Pretty amazing. Yeah, one of the greatest players that ever played the game, Willie Mays. Um, you know, they didn't used to um, call him um, five tool players back then, but he was one of them. And, um, uh, you know, a hitter, a, a fielder, an arm, he could run, He you know, he could do everything. And, uh, yeah, he he never even did that, so. And uh, Houston, we're going to move on to the Houston. Yes, Houston def- uh, defeated Chicago in four games. This is five straight American League Championship Series that Houston is going to. The uh, And they're going to be playing Boston now. Experience in, on Houston's side, you'd have to say. Dusty Baker uh, going for his elusive World Series championship as manager. But you're picking Boston. Well, you know... They- <laughs> Look what they've done so far, and look what they did this year, and none of it was expected. And they're just playing good as a team together. Alex Cora, the manager, has done a great job. You know, they actually have a couple of uh, L.A. guys that uh, I really loved, but we gave them up to get Mookie Betts. And, um, you know, um, Enrique Hernandez has just had had an incredible series. And then Alex Verdugo, they're both starting uh, for Boston since they've been there. And... um, uh, and again, Alex Cora does a great job managing, you know, in that four game series, they scored Boston scored 31 runs and gave up 20 Houston in their four game series scored 31 runs and gave up 18. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other stats we could get into that are pretty, uh, pretty comparative, but so I think it's going to be a good series. Yeah, Houston has the, the home field advantage and this is, this is best of seven in, um, so um, in the ALCS, and uh, so I think it'll be really good. I, I think Boston will win, and I think it will go um, seven games. Well, everybody wants to see a seven-game series. I, I hope you're right about that. Uh, getting back to Atlanta, I'm not sure exactly how that works. If San Francisco wins, obviously they would be hosting Atlanta. But the Dodgers, since they're a wild card, I guess they would have to open in Atlanta. I'd have to assume, that's, right? That's Even exactly though- correct. Yeah, I, Atlanta and, and San Francisco won the divisions. San Francisco had a better record, so they'll be at home. Um, if L.A. plays Atlanta, yeah, L.A. had a way better record than Atlanta, but Atlanta won a division, and we were a wild card. So we would be on the road. And we know how you feel if the Dodgers win. You have them advancing. But let's say, for the sake of argument, the Giants win. Uh, how would you have that series going? Uh, Giants would be home field, as we just mentioned, against Atlanta. Yeah, I'd, it'd be hard not to pick San Francisco. Um, but look what Atlanta has done, um, especially since losing uh, Ronald Acuna Jr., probably their best player um, uh, besides, you know, Freddie Freeman, I, you know, but, you know, Acuna, young guy, great player. Unfortunately, they lost him for the, the season in the playoffs and they've just done a, a really good job uh, hitting and pitching. So I, um, it, I, would I be surprised if Atlanta won? No, not at all. Well, you're giving Atlanta a lot of credit. Um, they, yeah. They and the did. giants obviously deserve a lot of credit that that was, you know, they won 107 games and, you know, they've, they've just done a phenomenal job, uh, on both sides of the ball. And, 
and they deserve to be where they're at. And hopefully they go home after tomorrow or they stay home after tomorrow when the Dodgers beat them in San Francisco. That's what I'm hoping. Gotcha. So, um, no, that Tampa Bay has been eliminated. You have to make a new World Series prediction. You have Boston in the World Series and the Dodgers. And you uh, I, obviously you have the Dodgers winning it. And uh, you're going to make a prediction on how yeah. many games? Uh, this yeah, year? I say um, it will be um, L.A. and Boston. And L.A. will win in six. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, we'll have you on later in the You Got Hosed segment. All right, Joe. Thanks for having me. Our final guest today is hockey aficionado, Gator Gates. How are you feeling today, Gator? Oh, I'm excellent, Joe. Thank you. National Hockey League regular season started yesterday. Did you happen to watch the games, and what did you see? Well, Joe, uh, the game that I did get to watch was the Seattle and the Las Vegas game. Uh, Vegas got out to a 3 nothing lead, and at about halfway through the game before Seattle got their first goal um, from uh, Ryan Donato, actually. Um, yeah, so that, that was really nice that he got one, but they did end up losing four to three. A pretty good showing for the first game out of the shoot. Well, um, I did I, like I this. Guess, uh, Seattle uh, has really fast skaters. I was kind of impressed with that. I do think that their weakness is that they need somebody that's going to hit. Uh, they didn't show me a lot of hitting or physical play. Well, that's something for them to work on. And uh, in the other game, Joe, the- yeah, in the other game, Joe, Pittsburgh and Tampa Bay, um, Tampa Bay came out real slow. Now, I didn't really watch the game. It was 6-2 to two in the final. Uh, but Jerry, their goalie, was 26-28. of 28. And that tells me that uh, you, and when you're a goalie, the stats that you're looking for is one out of 10, one goal out of 10. So uh, 28 shots, he only let in two goals. So he did really great. But on the flip side of that, as Tampa Bay should have 10 shots per period. So you should have a total of 30 shots. So I don't think that they were really on their game, and it's really hard to tell where they're sitting right now. Well, you know, that's fine with me, Tampa Bay. I'm, they've just won two consecutive cups. I do not want them to win three in a row. I'm, I'm tired of them now. Um, Understandable, I don't Joe. Anybody basically win at this point. Right. I was going to say the last time that they had a 3 P was when the Islanders did it in the 80s. Right. 79 to 83, if I remember right. Uh, 80, so uh, 80 to 80, right, 79, that's correct. I was thinking 80 to 83, but yes, 79, 80 season. Well, we've already made predictions for the playoffs last week and the week before. Uh, do you have any predictions for regular season awards this year? Sure, Joe. Uh, the big one that everybody knows is the Hart Trophy, and that's for the MVP in the league. Um, that is voted by the Pro- Professional Writers Association. Last year, McDavid won it for Edmonton, and he is again the favorite at three to one. Um, but uh, Mackinnon from Colorado, of course, the Avalanche, he's at seven to one, and that's where I would. That's who I think is going to win it this year, McKinnon. Well, McDavid scored 105 points in that shortened 56-game season last year. That's pretty remarkable. He was on pace for, uh, what, about 150 or so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So uh, He definitely deserved it last year. Yeah, he definitely deserves Vez- to be the favorite, too. I agree with that. How about the Vesna Trophy, which goes to the best goaltender? Well, again, yeah, the best goaltender of the regular season. And uh, Vasilevsky is the favorite again. Same with David. Uh, they should be favored. But um, I have two other goalies, Joe. I got Verlamov, who can is at 12-1 to 1 for the Islanders. And, of course, I'm always praising the Islanders because every year they just keep getting better and better. And the other one I really like is Grubauer, if he can get Seattle to the postseason. And he's sitting at 15-1. to 1. You didn't pick any, any Boston goaltender, unfortunately, but... I, I do like the Islander goaltender. Uh, I'm going to pick him while I'm off. That will be my choice. Uh, let's move on to the Adams Trophy, which goes to the best coach. Yeah, correct. And and this one is uh, voted on by the Broadcasters Association, um, who contributed the most to their team. You, I, I don't see how you can do anybody besides Trotz, but Trotz is at 8-1, to one and... Uh, I think that's a great price. Now, Boston Cassidy is at 10 to 1. Um, that's a very good pick as well. Trots at 8 to 1. That's 
pretty good. So sheets sheets are available in the sports books apparently. Oh, correct. Uh, I haven't seen any. Uh, the Norris Trophy going to the best defenseman. Yeah, correct. Um, that's actually named after James Norris of the Red Wings, and uh, I have to go hands down with McCarr. The books have him at four and a half, and the next person that they have close to him would be a uh, headman from Tampa Bay. Um, I just think hands down McCarr is way better than any other defenseman out there. Oh, and what team does he play for? Uh, Colorado Avalanche, correct. Oh, there you go. I should have known. And the um, Calder Trophy, which goes to the best rookie, this is probably going to be the hardest one to pick, I would assume. Oh, by far. It's very hard for me to pick this one. I don't follow the kids as much. Um, if we go with the books here. The book says that uh, Calfield, who's playing for Montreal, is at four and a half to one. And then the next one that's next to him would be Raymond for Detroit at 12 to one. Um, now, Montreal, I have no clue what to think of Montreal this year, Joe. Um, they, you know, they were a four C going to the playoffs last year. They got to the Stanley Cup, didn't show much there. And now they just seem to be having all kinds of issues. Well, how about the goaltender, Harry Price? Uh, he was, Seattle did not pick him in the expansion draft when he was made available. And uh, it seems like he's having some kind of issues. Yeah. Uh, is he okay? Well, Price uh, voluntarily went into the NHL Player Association Program for Mental Health. Now, Joe, he did play 15 years in the NHL League, and what I find amazing is that he did it all with Montreal. Uh, yes, he's always been a Canadian. Last year was shocking, as badly as they played in the regular season. He basically carried him, carry, no pun intended, <laughs> all the way to the uh, finals. Yeah, the correct. Season. If it wasn't for yeah. them, they wouldn't. If, in my eyes, if it wasn't for Price, they wouldn't even have been there. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was. So, is hockey actually a popular sport to bet on these days? Well, it, it's the fourth popular sport um, among the sports bettors. Uh, the average MLB game draws five times more than a hockey game does. So not really too popular, but uh, still and fourth, it, fourth, not bad. Well, it's really hard to determine how much uh, wagering is going on in hockey because Colorado is the only one that actually keeps track of hockey bets. Um, seems like the rest of the uh, – Books. They do it as far as putting soccer, hockey, those kind of sports together. Speaking of betting on hockey, the Sharks forward, Evander Kane, uh, it was rumored by his wife, or estranged wife, divorced wife, I'm not sure exactly right now, uh, yeah. that maybe he was betting on Sharks games? Well, yeah, Joe, they did do an investigation, and after the investigation, they didn't have any real proof of um say that he was betting on hockey so i really don't okay. know yeah yeah he was sued by a vegas casino for five hundred thousand uh, dollars in this debt he had when he filed for a bankruptcy they found that he lost 1.5 million dollars uh, gamble but yeah uh, they said there was no proof that he actually bet on hockey uh, television this year will be on uh, ESPN, ABC, and TNT. We'll find hockey uh, that's going to be different from CNBC. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, Joe, um, I do remember when uh, ESPN had hockey, before, you know, the first time around, and I wasn't too really too impressed with it. I really did love the way that NBC Sports Network had their hockey. I loved having Jonesy there. Um, but ESPN this year, I saw that Weeks is going to be um, one of their broadcasters, and I really love his commentary. He's a great goalie. Um, so I'll give him a chance, but I did not, if I'm being honest, did not like it the first time around with the uh, ESPN. Right. Well, let's move on to NASCAR. Kyle Larson won last week. He, yeah, correct. Uh, he's finished. Uh, that was uh, the Roval in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that turn? And what do we have to look forward to for the rest of the season? Um, well, I, I didn't really get to watch the race, but when I did get the glance up at it, it seemed like just a normal, you know, very 
simple race. There was not too much action like I expected it to be. But yeah, Joe Larson did win the Elber at Charlotte. Um, that does put him the points leader for the round of eight. He does have 4,065 points. Now Hamlin, who's in second, has 4,030 points. Truex is right behind him with 4,029. Now uh, Harvick, which I figured that if he didn't win in uh, Talladega that he wasn't going to make the round of eight, and he did get ninth place, so he is out. So we're going to move on to Texas, Kansas, and Martinsville for the uh, next three races. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, I do like that. I like that they're going to, um, they're not small tracks by no means. They're not super speedway tracks. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, the pit crews have to get their cars, you know, exactly right at these tracks. Um, I, it seems like a lot of times at Texas, they, you know, take a wedge out, add a wedge, you know, half a wedge. It's the constantly when they're coming into the pits doing that type of thing. Um, so that is interesting if, you know, a lot of people say, well, we just watch the cars go around in circles. You know, this might be one of those races where those type of fans will probably think it's boring. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of those. But uh, we are down near the end of the uh, playoffs now. So, uh, but- but that's why I'm glad that NASCAR did put the playoffs in, Joe. That's where it makes it more exciting for those types of tracks, correct? And one last note, uh, Major League Soccer star Felipe Hernandez was suspended for betting on Major League Soccer online. He bet on two games in his own sport. I guess he had some fear. He owed some money, uh, went to the league. He had some gambling bets, and they did an investigation and found out he was betting on his own sport. He's yeah, Joe. I, yeah, I don't think personally. I mean, I don't think any athlete should be able to uh, bet on any the sport that you are part of that entity of of that industry. So, if you're a hockey player, sure, you go ahead and bet on NASCAR, but you can't bet on hockey. I just I'm totally against that. Yeah, I think everybody's in agreement there. Thank you, Gator. We'll have you on later for the You Got Host segment. All right, Joe, thank you so much. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time for the moments we've all been waiting for, the stories that make us furious about bets that appeared surely to be winners, but in the end something went horribly wrong. They ended up being losers. It's the segment we affectionately call You Got Hosed. You Got Hosed. So, Big Richard, do you have a You Got Hosed story this week? Oh, I got a double you got hose story this week. First one was Oklahoma and Texas. Texas is just rolling all over Oklahoma. Steve Sarkeesian is putting on that gold hat, seeing how good it's going to look on himself. I think I got a winner. I got points and Texas. No way I could lose, right? Six seconds left. We're going to kick a field goal. Still cover the spread. And like I said before, there he goes for a touchdown. And I got hosed on that bet. And the other one was Penn State. Their quarterback goes out in the second quarter after he's looking like he, he's got Iowa eating out of the palm of his hands. And he goes out with a shoulder injury. So I had my Penn State plus one and a half. That went out the thing. So I'm telling you right now, I got double hosed this week, Joe. Yeah, well, that's what you get for betting against Oklahoma. But that's just me talking. But, yes, the Penn State one, for sure, the injury was a killer. Yeah, and the Texas looked like they had that game in the bag. I mean, I, I, they were up 20. What a game. The, what a game. Brought, anyway. So, Ronnie, let's hear your You Got Host story for this week. Well, Joe, uh, you got to go to Monday night um, at Dodger Stadium Game 3. Um, you know, uh, a great pitch game. Uh, the Giants obviously pitched great. The Dodgers, Scherzer pitched awesome. Um, and it was one to nothing. And um, late in the game, uh, and the, and here's the the deal, is that the wind was blowing really heavy in, in Dodger Stadium, which very seldom ever happens. I've been there tons of times going way back. And, um, and everybody knows it just doesn't blow there much. And um, uh, Gavin Lux hit one. And all the Giants, uh, it was to left field. So the third baseman, the outfielder, Crawford at short, everybody afterwards said, oh, yeah, as soon as he hit it, we thought, damn, it's tied one to one. And the wind brought it straight down and it, the ball was caught. Um, actually, Taylor hit one also that everybody thought was gone and the wind brought that one down. Um, 
you know, not making excuses. The Giants won. Uh, it was a great game, but, you know, it was just something that very seldom ever happens in, in Dodger Stadium with the wind blowing in like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the Dodgers, uh, I'll say they got hosed and so did I. So, so you know, it was, um, it was, it was pretty crazy, but, um, you know, they, you got to score runs to win a game still. And, um, uh, you know, it was a one to nothing game. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it's strange, you know, scoring the, the most runs in the national league this year. And they've been shut out twice in this series, um, by the giants. And then, um, in the two games they won, it was, um, you know, uh, nine and seven to two. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty, um, pretty interesting it's um in the four games the dodgers have scored 16 runs and the giants have scored nine but it's it's two games to two but anyway yeah that was uh that was a, a hose there so gator let's hear your you got hose story this week okay joe um inter miami has lost five consecutive games uh sunday they were playing new york red bull and their coach phil neville demanded a massive investigation into the Major League Soccer referees after their loss to one to nothing. Now, Neville at the news conference after the game uh, said that, I'm just going to go full barrel. We, are, we got cheated in Portland and again tonight. We also, he also went on to say, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but something is fundamentally wrong with the way the refs treat the inter Miami. Now, Phil also said that he has a dressing room that is questioning the integrity of the league in terms of decisions we keep getting. He went on to say, I can't accept this. I've got to defend my club against something unjust and wrong. I feel we are being cheated. The players are in too much of an emotional state to talk to you guys, the press, because they feel so strong about it that what's going on and it's not just the last four games joe it's uh was earlier in the season too and he says that he's sick and tired of receiving emails on monday saying sorry so neville also added he didn't have a problem with the on-field official who was tony peso uh, a female uh referee said had an outstanding game and it was incredibly uh, diminished by the VAR system. So if you had Miami in the last few weeks, you got hosed. Joe, uh, Diablo, you got host story for this week? Well, you know, I didn't get a host this week. In fact, I was on the correct side of some hosiery. As I mentioned earlier, I had the Los Angeles Chargers point spread. The people who got hosed are the ones that Cleveland plus the two and a half points. Cleveland was leading 42-41 with less than two minutes left, and the Chargers were on the Cleveland three-yard line. L.A. was just trying to just run the clock down and kick a field goal to win 44-42, so they run the ball. But the Browns had their own ideas. They wanted the ball back, so they pushed and pulled running back Austin Eckler into the end zone to make the score 47-42, which ended up being the final score. So it was the Browns themselves who forced the last touchdown that hosed everyone who took Cleveland. Yeah, Joe, you got hosed, buddy. Yeah, I got the good end of the hose. No, it you got the good Cle end of the hose. <laughs> Sorry. Got you got hosed. So that's it for this week. I'd like to thank my guests, Big Richard Martin, Ronnie McKinnon, and Gator Gates, our producer, our engineer, our editor, and everyone for listening. We'd like you to visit our Covering the Field website. And we'd like to remind you listeners to email us at coveringthefield at gmail.com. Give us your feedback, your You Got Host moments, and any other comments you'd like to give us. And find us on Twitter at Covering Field. Hopefully you all enjoyed the show, and you'll hear us again next week on another episode of Covering the Field. been listening to covering the field a cm world services and lesage production